and its causes. One of the aspects that uh, I perhaps can use in mitigation as being a diving physician, being on this podium, is that of course divers get in the water. And so in one sense they're returning to an aquatic environment. But as you can see, my first slide is in fact developing fetus. And in the early stages of implantation and development, the oxygen levels are incredibly low. Now there's a cascade of oxygen, which is perfectly obvious when you think about it, from the oxygen which is in the air, which goes down into the respiratory tree, goes down to the alveoli, crosses across into the blood, and is then transported to the tissues something that we're all doing right now. But of course, with the developing child, there is an additional route. Because from the tissues of the, the womb, oxygen has to cross the placenta. And from the placenta, it is then carried to the developing fetus. Very early on, of course, there isn't very much placenta. The Im implanted ovum implants into the endometrium of the womb and develops very rapidly. But the reason for stressing this is that we do actually at cellular level require very little oxygen indeed. Now I don't want to bring in too many numbers because by and large they don't really mean a great deal. But if we take the number 150 as the value at the alveolus of the oxygen that is transferred from your breath into the body, by the time it reaches the activity centers in the cell, it comes down to very, very low values. Values of the order of about five millimeters of mercury. From 150 then, the cascade is down to five. Now the reason for stressing this is that there does not seem to be any reason for supposing that these very low oxygen values also applies, ap apply to the cells which are inside you and inside me right now. So that in other words, this cascade of oxygen down to the mitochondria of the cells is from about 150 down to about 5 in order for cells to function. Now, in this cascade, many things can interrupt the flow of oxygen. The most obvious thing is if somebody grasps, grasps you warmly by the throat, and you go blue, and you don't breathe very well. And so immediately, you start reducing the levels of, of each of the resistances all the way down to the cellular level. And the first thing, of course, is that you lose consciousness because the brain has a massive demand for oxygen. But as we'll see, there's evidence, certain evidence, that the requirements for oxygen, even in nerve cells in the brain and in the nervous system, are very, very small indeed. And that most of the problem that relates to the withdrawal of sufficient level, levels of oxygen, whether it be through the lungs or through the placenta to the developing child, results in changes which apply to blood vessels and the relationship between blood and the nervous tissue. This shows the oxygen concentration the oxygen tension and the, the mitochondrial oxidative phosphorylation. Now, I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but basically oxygen and glucose are the two essential things that we need in order to provide the substrate for forming what are termed the high energy phosphates. And these are required to do all the chemical work in the cell to construct proteins in particular, but also for activities 
like nerve activity. In other words, the electrical activity that the brain is capable of. And you can see that if you lower the level of oxygen, the concentration down towards zero, the actual utilization of oxygen has to fall. It reaches this plateau and then right up to this kind of level, at mitochondrial level, where you run into toxicity, essentially is pretty much a straight line. Well, in hypoxia at birth, what are the problems? Well, uterine contractions. It's obvious. When you clench your fist, you reduce the blood flow in your hand. The blood flow in the muscles is reduced. And eventually, you can't sustain the grip. If you grip really hard, there is no blood supply whatever in your fist. How can we show that? Very, very simply. If you take a simple blood pressure cuff that's attached to a blood pressure machine, just put a little air in it and hold it and squeeze it attached to the mas machine, and you will find that you can probably produce a pressure of, say, quite easily 150 millimeters of mercury. If you've got reasonably normal blood pressure, the maximum pressure that your heart is pushing out is about 120. So you're actually squeezing more in terms of pressure than your heart is pushing out. That means that you stop the blood flow. And you can see, as a result of clenching a fist, the, fish, the, the tissues of the, of the hand go white. And so doing that, you can see, you stop the blood flow. And as soon as that happens, you create an oxygen debt. Eventually, as I've said, you have to give way and release it. And that oxygen debt is then repaid. So uterine contractions inevitably reduce the blood supply to the uterus itself, hence the pain, to the placenta, and hence the developing baby. So if it occurs at the wrong time, then not surprisingly, it causes hypoxia to the developing infant. Then there are placental factors, including separation of the placenta, which can influence the delivery of oxygen to the child. The head is compressed, causing what we've termed already ischemic hypoxia, or hypoxic ischemia. What does it mean? Very simply, low blood, fl low blood flow, low oxygen. And then finally, when the head is delivered, it's decompressed. In other words, the pressure is removed. And that can actually cause tearing of tissues within the head. And a similar problem can occur with von Tu's extraction, the vacuum extraction. And obviously, the baby is vulnerable because we have to transfer from oxygenation from the placenta to oxygenation from the lungs. The child has to do that transition. This is the most dangerous part in our existence. So what factors can influence this? Prolonged labor and placental problems, especially when labor is prolonged.